All right. Hi, everyone. I see we're having people into the room right now. So I'm going to give that a little time because those numbers are getting bigger as I look at my screen. So we'll just see if we get to a, to a pause before I introduce myself, but welcome. Happy International Women's Day. All right, I think we've achieved a pause. All right, um, so welcome again. My name is Robin Rungi. Um, and I am uh, fortunate to be here as your moderator and also a participant on this wonderful International Women's Day uh, discussion. Um, and the hat that I'm wearing is that I am the vice chair of the Civil Rights and Social Justice section of the American Bar Association. Um, so good afternoon, good morning, good evening from wherever you're joining us. Um, we're really happy to have you with us to uh, commemorate International Women's Day by talking about ending gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work, uh, which is a hot uh, topic. Um, and importantly, this discussion is sponsored by the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. Um, and we have many, many other ABA entities that have co-sponsored this. And I just want to lift them up and recognize them, including the ABA Commission on Hispanic Legal Rights and Responsibilities, the ABA Commission on Racial and Ethnic Diversity in the Profession, the ABA Commission on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, the ABA Commission on Women in the Profession, the ABA International Law Section, the ABA Labor and Employment Law Section, the ABA Rule of Law Initiative, the ABA Section of State and Local Government Law, and the ABA Young Lawyers Division. So we have a great, uh, lineup of co-sponsors for this. Um, as you may know, the ABA section on civil rights and social justice have hosted a number of webinars. Um, we really uh, dove head into this uh, methodology during the pandemic and it's really served us well. And we've had a series of rapid response webinars throughout the last couple of years. And we're excited to continue this because we've really seen an incredible response from all of you. Um, and so we see this as a service that the section can continue to provide. Um, so with that, I'm gonna introduce my uh, co-discussants uh, or panelists. Um, I'm really thrilled that both of them are giving their time to us today for this important conversation. Um, first, we have uh, Carolyn Bettinger Lopez, who's a senior advisor on gender and equality in the Office of Victims of Crime at the US Department of Justice. And she is, um, uh, taking leave uh, from her status as a professor of law at the University of Miami School of Law to do that really important work uh, for the administration. And we're really thrilled that she's doing that and that she's with us today. And then we also have Muthoni Kamuyu. Oh gosh. Oh, can you, Muthoni, can you say your, your full name for us so we say it correctly going forward? Sure. Muthoni Kamuyu Ojolo. Muthoni Kamuyu Ojolo. Yep. Um, and she's the program director for Women and Girls Empowered, which is a really amazing program in the uh, American Bar Association's Rule of Law Initiative. And as I said, my uh, name is Robin Rungi, and I most recently have worked at the Solidarity Center, and I also teach um, some classes at George Washington University Law School. So um, to begin our uh, discussion today, um, we want to make sure that we... Um, uh, do some housekeeping. As you can see, hopefully there's closed captioning. So we wanna make sure that anyone who wants to access that knows how to do so. Um, and we wanna also um, highlight resources that um, we're gonna be providing in the chat. So please look throughout the webinar for resources to be placed um, in the chat box. Um, in addition to that, we really welcome this uh, conversation, and I mean conversation. So please use the Q&A feature, um, which is at the um, bottom of your screen. It literally says Q&A with little captioning boxes um, to type in your questions as we go through our conversation. Um, and then to start us off, I want to really lay some groundwork about what it is we're talking about, 
um, and the important relevance of a new international uh, treaty, human rights treaty that addresses gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. So I am going to share my screen for that purpose and hope that technology is working for me today. Excellent. Um, and I'm gonna do it in the slideshow mode, which means I can't see anybody else while I'm doing this. All right. So um, the first thing is just to ground ourselves in language. Um, in the United States, the, this term gender-based violence and harassment isn't used as regularly as, um, as it is globally, especially in the world of work. Um, we use terms like sexual harassment, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, sexual violence, all of which are forms of gender-based violence and harassment. But the term gender-based violence and harassment is broader and inclusive of all of those things. And this definition is the one that is often used globally, which is violence and harassment directed at people because of their sex or gender or affecting persons of a particular sex or gender disproportionately, and it includes sexual harassment. Importantly, gender-based violence and harassment encompasses violence and harassment against women, girls, men, boys, people who are lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, intersex, and other people who don't conform to dominant perceptions of gender. Right. Um, we know that certain populations disproportionately are targeted, but anyone and everyone um, may experience gender based violence and harassment in their lifetime, especially in the world of work. Um, as I said, it includes sexual harassment, domestic violence and sexual violence. It's rooted in discriminatory gender norms. Right. Um, and uh, really buttressed by a lack of accountability for perpetrators. And it includes it occurs, I have been doing global work for the last five years, it occurs in all societies as a means of control, subjugation, exploitation that reflects and reinforces gender inequality, right? And the power dynamics based on gender stereotypes of the roles of men and women in society. So um, after about 10 years of advocacy by the global workers' rights and union movement, there was a global movement and actually um, with human rights organizations and women's rights organizations, the International Labor Organization, which is a part of the UN, adopted Convention 190 and uh, Recommendation 206 concerning the elimination of violence and harassment in the world of work, including gender-based violence and harassment. Um, this achievement came about because workers, and specifically women workers from the global south, uh, domestic workers, agricultural workers, bisexual workers, transgender women, um, really led this fight and said that we cannot achieve gender equality and decent work for all workers unless we prevent and address gender-based violence and harassment. Um, and so it was really tremendous um, that this campaign led to the International Labor Organization adopting this first ever binding legal standard around um, all forms of violence and harassment, including gender-based violence and harassment. This is the first time this has happened. And it is um, important to note that the ILO is the only place in the world where employers, governments, and workers' rights organizations come together and negotiate these standards. So this standard actually is something that all three of those constituencies agreed upon. And importantly, the US government uh, voted in support of adoption by the ILO of this convention, which is really uh, significant. Um, in addition to that, uh, because of the advocacy, the multi-year advocacy campaign that was led by women workers, primarily from the global South, it takes um, both the convention and the recommendation take a feminist and gender responsive approach, recognizing that women and other workers experience multiple forms of exclusion and discrimination, right? And are facing the highest rates of violence and harassment. Um, and that their voices need to be centered in employer policies and legislation drafted to eliminate it. Um, these two tools also provide clear intersectional framework for preventing and addressing gender-based violence and harassment, describing the roles and responsibilities of governments, employers, and workers' organizations to ensure the right of all workers to be free from violence and harassment. And I think I just wanna lift that up. This convention established a human right to be free from all forms of gender-based violence and harassment and actually all forms of violence and harassment in the world of work. Um, and I really wanna lift that up because it is a, it's the first time that it, I, we now have a right, a human right that is acknowledged and recognized in this document. Um, and as a result, the parties to this have a duty to assure that that right is realized. Um, and so I just really wanna lift up 
uh, that part of the convention. Um, they're inclusive and intersectional in their approach to addressing gender-based violence and harassment. There's a broad definition of both violence and harassment and gender-based violence and harassment that addresses both structural and individual abuses. It recognizes that it's not enough to actually have an employer fire the person who is committing these acts in the workplace because, and workers have said this many, many times, the employer is just going to hire someone else with the same power who's going to continue the same behavior. So we actually need to look at how work is structured, right? And that's a key part of this. Um, it also has expansive coverage. So any government that ratifies this convention, and that's the process by which a government embraces this language, um, has to amend their laws to take on this broad definition of gender-based violence and harassment. But also the protections from these abuses need to be extended to all workers, regardless of contractual status. So that includes in the United States, independent contractors, consultants, right? Everybody, not just full-time employees. And that is a big shift. It also um, applies to the full world of work. It recognizes how work is performed today. And we've really experienced this in the last two years um, with the pandemic. People are working in all different kinds of ways, but this had already been happening before that. Workers are domestic workers who work in other people's homes. Workers are market workers who work in, the, in, in markets. Um, workers are Uber drivers. Workers are ticket toll booth operators, right? Any kind of worker. And it doesn't matter if you don't have a formal agreement. You're still performing work and you have a right to be free from all forms of gender-based violence and harassment. And then the third thing is that it really requires um, that the root causes of violence and harassment, including gender-based violence and harassment, be addressed in order for states, employers, and workers' organizations to meet their obligations. And I just want to pause here and say, as I mentioned, this um, was adopted by the ILO in 2019. We now have 12 countries, and I'll put the names of the countries in the box, that have ratified the convention already. Um, and just this week, um, Mexico uh, stated its intention to ratify the convention, which we're really excited about, and the UK just yesterday. Um, so it continues to be a fast moving um, treaty. And I just wanted to include this slide because I keep talking about this definition of violence and harassment in the world of work and then gender-based violence and harassment. So I actually took this directly out of the convention. And so it's important to see that the term violence and harassment recognizes that there's a range of behaviors that we're talking about here, right? It's not limited to criminal, right? It's not limited to civil. Um, it's not one, it could be one single occurrence or repeated, right? So it's not swept under the rug if it only happens once. And it really importantly, these are things that are that aim at, result in, or are likely to result in physical, psychological, or economic harm. And the definition of violence and harassment specifically includes gender-based violence and harassment because of the recognition of the pervasiveness. Um, the term gender-based violence and harassment means violence and harassment directed at persons because of their sex, gender, or affecting persons of a particular sex or gender disproportionately includes sexual harassment. I mentioned that earlier, but I just wanted to pull this particular language out because it's really relevant to our conversation today. Um, and then my last set of slides here is just to lift up and remind us that even with um, the Me Too movement over the last five years, which has been extremely powerful um, in having women and men uh, bring their voices forward through social media to share their experiences with different forms of gender-based violence and harassment, um, that, and that led to a lot of really good um, efforts in the last five years. State legislation that's been introduced and adopted, federal legislation that's been introduced um, a lot of really um, impressive efforts by employers and unions around the country to do something different, to write, try to ratify, um, try to address this issue. Recognizing based on what came about through Me Too and everyone coming forward, this understanding that it's still happening. What we've been doing, the hour video a year is not enough, right? <laughs> it's not working. So we need to grapple with this differently. And that's why the timing of this convention is so critical. Um, so I start actually because we are the American Bar Association with a survey that was done in 2018 um, by, of businesses and law firms that showed that 68% of female respondents had experienced sexual harassment. So sometimes we think that this only happens to certain classes of individuals, right, certain sectors of the economy. And that's just not true. Um, no one is free from experiencing this. 
Similarly, a 2020 survey of uh, technology employers, right, found that um, of the 44% of women founders who said they were harassed, 41% that they had ex said they experienced sexual harassment, including being pro propositioned for sex, being groped, and being sent graphic photos. Um, and then a survey that was conducted by Unite Local here, um, excuse me, Unite Here Local One in Chicago of hotel workers and casino workers found that 77% of casino workers um, and 58% um, of hotel workers surveyed in Chicago had been sexually harassed by a guest, including incidents like a guest answering the door naked or exposing themselves. So that's just my introduction to set the tone. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so I can see things. Um, and now I really want to turn it over to our um, panelists to really help us dive deeper um, into this, because I think what I was just trying to provide is some framework about where are we now, what are our challenges going forward, and what's great is we're going to hear from Muthani and from Carrie about um, particular um, programs and interventions, including by the ABA and by our the Biden administration, to really try to um, take this on. So, Muthoni, if I may turn to you first, can you talk to us a little bit about the program that you lead and, and share with us about how it's addressing gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work? Sure. Um, nice to be with you, Robin. Um, happy International Women's Day to you and to Carrie. <laughs> And to the rest of the audience, and just real quickly, wanted to thank the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice section for having me today and giving me the opportunity to highlight ABA Rowley's uh, work at the global level on um, the issue of GBV in the workplace. Um, WAGE, or the Women and Girls in Power program, is a program that I lead. Um, we don't explicitly work on the ILO convention, but our um, Technical interventions are aligned with guiding principles and standards of the ILO. Um, WAGE is a global program um, and implements across 15 countries, uh, 10 country initiatives in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and in Europe. And we're funded by the US Department of State's um, Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues, or SGWE. Um, the program is implemented in a consortium and ABA Rowley leads the consortium in close partnership with the Center for International Private Enterprise, Grameen Foundation and Search for Common Ground. And the goal essentially is to advance the status of girls, um, women and girls across the world. And we do this um, by in increasing the capacity of civil society organizations and private sector organizations to improve the response and prevention of gender-based violence, to advance the women peace and security agenda um, or UN um, resolution 1325 um, and promote women's economic empowerment. Um, our approach is integrated, it's multidisciplinary and inclusive um, and it seeks to transform gender uh, or power dynamics between uh, men and women and our country initiatives operate at the household, community, organizational, as well as government levels. Um, and we have tailored interventions specifically that um, work to address harmful social cultural norms or gender norms, uh, legal and policy barriers that prevent a woman from fully participating in the economy or political life, civic life, as well as peace building and reconciliation processes. And some of these interventions um, really focus on um, the workplace and changing the culture within the workplace, um, as well as um, promoting worker uh, driven solutions um, to make the workplace safer. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later. I'll, I'll just turn it over, um, I guess, to Carrie um, to also uh, uh, introduce her work as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Muthoni. And yes, thank you to Robin and Ali and the ABA's uh, Civil Rights and Social Justice section, as, as well as all of the other co-sponsors for hosting this uh, very exciting webinar today. It's uh, a very uh, important and timely topic, as Robin said, and I'll be um, sharing with you a few uh, hot hot issues straight off, hot off the press um, from the administration. Um, so yes, my name is Carrie Bettinger Lopez. I'm currently serving as a senior advisor on gender and equality at the Department of Justice Office for Victims of Crime. 
And I previously had the opportunity to work with President Biden as his advisor on violence against women um, from 2015 to 17 in the Obama Biden White House. Uh, and so it's really wonderful for me to be back in government and uh, have a chance to put a lot of the dreams, the big dreams that uh, we had in the prior administration uh, towards the tail end uh, and, and then seeing all the civil society, um, the generation of civil society action over the past several years and uh, the Me Too movement and, um, and then the development of uh, the C-190 uh, a treaty um, to really uh, kind of propel us to this next place. And so um, we're really excited to share with you today. And, and I'm excited to talk about some of the ways in which I kind of with my normal hat as a human rights uh, law professor am interested in uh, putting a lot of these international human rights and uh, gender justice principles into action um, in a real way, uh, in a concrete law and policy way uh, here at the domestic level. Um, so happy to talk more about what the administration is currently doing, um, as well as kind of where some of these um, ideas fit into our, um, our re-entry into uh, the global space and looking at um, other countries and, um, and other models. Uh, and thinking in a very humble way about ways in which we can bring those models and those principles home to the United States. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Carrie and Muthoni. Um, it's, uh, you're both doing just tremendous work and your commitment is um, clear. And so I think we're excited to um, get into our conversation. And so just for the audience to know, what we're gonna do now is kind of move into what we would call a fishbowl where I'm gonna try to play a moderator and we have some questions for um, Muthoni and for Carrie and also um, I think I'm going to try to add in some from, from my perspective as well into these, um, into these topics. So, um, and then we're going to open it up importantly to questions for all of you. Um, so again, please use the Q&A feature or the chat box if you have questions. And if you're like me, and if you don't um, provide your question when you think of it, you forget it. That happens to me all the time. <laughs> so please feel free that as questions occur to you to put them in the box, but we're going to wait until we get to the Q&A segment to go to those. Um, so my first question is for you, Muthoni. Can you give an example of the work that uh, WAGE is doing um, globally? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I can talk a bit about our programming in El Salvador and Honduras. We're implementing a reducing barriers women's, uh, to women's economic empowerment initiative there. We call it WAGE RBI. Um, and, and as mentioned, our approach is integrated. And so what that means in practical terms is each wage consortium partner, so ABA Rowley, um, SIPE, Grameen, and, and Search for Common Ground, bring a unique set of expertise to the program such that we're able to work at the nexus between uh, GBV prevention and response and WPS, for example, or uh, WPS and women's economic empowerment. Essentially, all 10 initiatives have multiple components. Um, and so each program begins with a barrier assessment and kind of gets a lay of the land. What's sort of the social cultural norms at play and how do they impact women? Um, and those assessments um, also look at legal and policy barriers and are really tailored to the thematic um, area that each in initiative focuses on. Each wage initiative has a technical lead um, and a technical support partner. So. For this particular initiative, Grameen Foundation is a technical lead in the area of women's economic empowerment. Uh, ABA Roley provides GBV uh, prevention and response expertise, and then Search for Common Ground Conflict uh, Mitigation. SIPE provides uh, women's economic empowerment support um, as well, um, and has integrated some of its tools into the barrier assessment. Um, we have three local partners um, across both countries. So ODEF in Honduras and then Credit Campo and Pedescom in El Salvador. And these are microfinance institutions. Um, and then we also partner with a US-based not-for-profit online loan matching fund um, or platform called Kiva. And the program components really are twofold. So um, the first component looks at improving access to to women entrepreneurs for financial services. And then the other component looks at technical assistance, which I'll get to in a little bit. 
So the access to financial services really that's done through our partnership with Kiva who um, established a donor uh, advised fund um, that um, has been used to disperse um, loans to 10,000 women entrepreneurs across El Salvador and Honduras, um, upwards of $5.4 million has been dispersed. And then our technical assistance component, um, Ali, if you could share the slide, please, um, that talks about technical assistance package. So the technical assistance package really, um, it focuses at the institutional level uh, in a way that promotes cultural change. Um, and it also, and, and promotes worker solutions to problems. Um, and that uh, technical assistance package also includes training and linking our MFI partners or microfinance institution partners to GBB survivor support services. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, the Grameen Foundation um, supported our MFI partners to um, undertake an internal policy review, um, really to put gender at the forefront of their operations um, and to improve the workplace. And what that review found was a lack of institutional gender and do no harm safeguarding policies, for instance, inadequate sexual harassment reporting mechanisms, uh, complaint mechanisms available to staff, um, lack of reporting mechanisms for clients who are experiencing GBV, a lack of market analysis that examines social norms and a customer and household harm analysis. And the policy review was really done um, using a social uh, performance management methodology that has been uh, adopt, adapted or excuse me, created by the microfinance um, sector that has specific standards that it assesses each microfinance institution um, uh, with. And the goal really is to put the client at the center of, of financial services. And those standards align very much with the ILO um, and specifically those that are focused on um, protections for workers or safeguarding or do no harm. Grameen will soon be um, supporting our MFI partners to update um, and address gaps in those policies or create new policies. And ABA Rowley will uh, be reviewing those policies from a do no harm and safeguarding perspective, but then also just assessing how practical they are in terms of implementation, what structures need to be in place, et cetera, um, to operationalize those policies. Um, and the objective of that assistance really is to improve the MFI's capacity to provide integrated and better financial services to women entrepreneurs. Um, and also to take into account the unique experience that women entrepreneurs um, have um, that many people don't often think about. This is really important work because we're seeing in the data and this even predates obviously wage, um, but across many of the wage initiatives, we're seeing that you know, as a woman's um, financial independence increases or her income increases, this often unfortunately shifts many times the power dynamics in the household and puts her at risk for GBV um, by an intimate partner. And a lot of um, CSOs who focus on economic strengthening, for instance, for women or microfinance institutions who provide financial services to women entrepreneurs really don't make the link between how GBV could be an unintended consequence of women's economic empowerment. And then quickly, I'll talk about our training. Um, Grameen has um, implemented several trainings with, M with our partner MFI staff, both at the management and staff uh, uh, field officer level that really um, focuses on helping them to better understand how gender, power and conflict sort of interplay off of each other and really walking through these participants through a process where they interrogate or explore their unconscious biases and how that plays out at the household level, how that plays out at the workplace and into broader society and allows GBV to remain unchecked. Um, and Grameen developed this training curriculum with support of Search for Common Ground um, by integrating their common ground peace building approach. And then lastly, um, our linkages component where we've um, linked our MFI partners to a digital platform called Quentinos, uh, which is operated by the International Rescue Committee, um, an INGO that provides um, humanitarian relief 
And that uh, particular uh, platform provides information on GBV um, service support, uh, support services, health education, legal assistance, citizen protection, shelter, et cetera. Um, and really provides critical and reliable information that would allow, for instance, one of the women entrepreneurs to access GBV support services if they're experiencing GBV as a result of migration or, for example, displacement or conflict or, you know, just at because of uh, being a woman entrepreneur and having that additional risk. So that just kind of, we come at this a bit differently and can kind of, I hope I painted a picture, picture of how our work um, contributes to improving work uh, culture and um, protections for workers. Thank you so much, uh, Muthoni. There's just so many things that I, as you said at the outset that I wanna lift up that really embody the values, right? And the approach that the Convention 190 um, also has. First, the culture change piece, right? Like really lifting up this recognition. And there's been a lot of great work done in the last, I mean, even before Me Too in the States, but this is still evolving. We're still learning. How do you change the culture, right? In a workplace to make it truly safe? Because that's actually our goal, right? If we create uh, culture change so that the environment is one that is safe and that when feel, people do feel that they're experiencing these things that they can come forward, um, and seek assistance without retribution, without retaliation, um, right? That's that's critical. And then our end goal really is that it goes away entirely, right? So that we don't have to focus so much on complaint systems, which often unfortunately back up on survivors, right? Because it all goes to like, well, they're not using the complaint system and that's the problem. And it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> like let's not focus exclusively on complaint structures. Let's think about like, why is it she needs one uh, in the first place? And so I really just wanna live lift that up. And then the other piece that's really pivotal that you talk about is this, what, what the convention refers to is really gender sensitive and gender centric, but it's also this do no harm principle, right? It's a recognition that any interventions need to recognize um, the trauma that is related to experiencing gender-based violence and harassment, and that a trauma-informed approach is critical to ensuring that interventions in the world of work are effective. And then the third thing that you talked about that I really um, thought it was important to lift up is this intersection that gender-based violence and harassment, unfortunately, takes place in all facets of people's lives, particularly women, right? As someone who's been representing survivors now for 30 years, I have represented survivors who've experienced it in their home as children or as adults. Then I've represented survivors who've experienced it on their walk or their transport to work or school. And then I've represented um, survivors who've experienced it at school, at the hands of staff or teachers or fellow students. And I've represented survivors who've experienced it in the world of work, right? Um, and, and that's really important to keep in mind because what we know is that people aren't segmented, right? And so that if they're experiencing gender-based violence and harassment, or if what is happening at work, it can actually exacerbate existing intimate partner violence in the home or like be one of the risk factors and that that negatively impacts their ability to maintain and obtain employment, right? And this is one of the things that we know is key to, to safety and security in the long run. So the convention actually specifically addresses that and tasks governments and employers and workers' rights organizations with incorporating into their interventions a recognition of the impact of domestic violence and intimate partner violence on the world of work. There were many other things you said that I wanna lift up, but I wanna shift over um, to Carrie and thank you for sharing um, that product program because it's really inventive, I think in many ways and brings together all these different pieces in a way that I've not seen before. Um, so, so with that, Carrie, I thought I would um, turn to you with a, a question really tailored to kind of the, the work that you, as you described, you had taken on previously and, and are resuming now, which is, um, can you give some examples of how the federal government has taken steps um, to address um, gender-based violence in the, or in the process, right, uh, of addressing gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work? Um, there's been a long, you know, uh, a long-standing commitment and really recently with the leadership of the Biden administration, there's a clear commitment to this, um, but it'd be great to hear some specific examples from you. Sure, thank you. And yes, Muthoni, that was so um, inspiring and uh, grounding for us to hear about your programs. So this is great actually for me because it's a good segue 
uh, for me to talk. I'm going to talk about three buckets of uh, work that the Biden-Harris administration is engaged with that um, seeks to address gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. Um, so the first is a first ever national action plan on gender-based violence uh, that we are undertaking right now. We're very excited about this. Um, and I'll just back up for a moment. Uh, one year ago today uh, on International Women's Day, um, President Biden issued an executive order establishing the Gender Policy Council in the White House. And probably most people on, on this webinar know about the GPC, but maybe some of you don't. So just briefly, I'll say that the GPC, the Gender Policy Council, is on par with other policy councils in the White House, like the Domestic Policy Council or National Security Council. It's focused on what it means to integrate gender equality and gender equity across all of our policies, our federal policies, in a whole of government approach. And um, all the cabinet members uh, are considered part of the council. Uh, haven't seen it yet. Uh, and uh, that directs the Gender Policy Council to uh, develop, uh, excuse me, the, the executive order that established the Gender Policy Council directed the Gender Policy Council to develop the strategy, which it did last October, with input of both internal federal government as well as external stakeholders. And uh, very exciting through the process of developing the strategy, uh, the federal government had several consultations with other countries. Again, to my point earlier of kind of uh, looking, looking abroad um, for lessons learned from uh, other countries of how they've done this because many countries are leaders in, in this space and we have a lot to learn from them. And uh, including about kind of intersectional forms of discrimination and violence uh, that happen across race and gender lines. Um, and so the national strategy that developed was really a 30,000 foot view of what it means to advance gender equality, gender equity from an intersectional lens. Um, and it has 10 strategic priority areas, one of which is eliminating gender-based violence. They also have economic security, health, human rights, leadership, and a range of different issues. Uh, and um, I might add that there's a shout out to the to uh, the, the International Labor Convention on Eliminating Violence and Harassment in the World of Work. Um, and uh, and we, the, the strategy mentions that the US specifically welcomes the adoption of that convention, which is very exciting. Uh, okay, so that brings me then to uh, the Gender-Based Violence National Action Plan that we are working on right now um, that I'm assisting uh, with the development of. And uh, that, that is one of the action items that is the implementation arm of this 30,000 foot plan. So this is kind of landing the plane as uh, Rosie Dalgo, who is the senior advisor on gender-based violence and special assistant to the president likes to say. Um, and so uh, this national action plan to gender-based violence um, is designed to, uh, to really kind of uh, established whole of government approach. And many other countries around the world have these national action plans, around 78 countries have them. So the United States is joining the party. And uh, we, um, we're we really looking to develop something that is strategic, long-term, multi-sectoral, um, that is designed to address the underlying causes of gender-based violence. Um, and uh, and not be kind of in reactive mode. And so a lot of our, you know, our domestic legislation, such as the Violence Against Women Act, Victims of Crime Act, Family, uh, Family Violence Prevention Services Act, all of those are very important components of a whole of government effort, but this is intended to build upon those and do something that is goal oriented and uh, forward looking and community informed. And so to that end, um, we have been engaged in a series of listening sessions. Um, I detailed with the Gender Policy Council in the fall, then went back into my teaching mode and civil society hat, and now I'm in DOJ. So when I say we, it's kind of skating across these various hats. Um, but, I, but I want to kind of highlight that these 20 or so civil society listening sessions um, really did focus in large part on, on the world of work. I'll talk more about them later in this program, um, but, uh, but I wanna just lift up uh, six different 
arenas that we're really focusing on with gender-based violence, one of which is economic security and housing. Uh, and these issues of you know, violence, gender-based violence in the world of work are so pivotal for prevention, security, and options for survivors. Um, I, I, I don't wanna belabor uh, this, this, so I'll just say there's you know, several other areas, um, including prevention and justice systems um, and technology. Uh, wellness and trauma-informed uh, approaches that are all undergirding this national action plan. Um, but that is the first. Uh, that is the first thing I wanted to talk about as kind of a whole of government approach to addressing this problem. Um, and, uh, and, and the agencies and specifically the Department of Labor, um, alongside many other of our agencies that are looking at economic security and the world of work are, are working hard to um, develop some specific action items uh, that are, we're gonna be delivering in this national action plan. Um, I just want to talk for a moment uh, about a couple other a couple other things that you may uh, be familiar with um, that I, I think also represent the federal government's commitment to addressing gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. Um, the first is a 2012 presidential memorandum uh, that has been given new life recently. Uh, that memorandum directs all federal government agencies to develop workplace policies on domestic violence. And it was further developed by the Office on Personnel Management and uh, the Office on Violence Against Women at DOJ, uh, which developed guidance for agency-specific DVSAS, as we say, domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking policies. That was in February of 2013. Um, and when I was in the White House in 2015 to 17, I had the opportunity to work across the agencies to really think about what it meant to, um, to adopt that and, and embed that in, at the agency level in terms of adopting policies. And I'm thrilled to see that uh, last year in June of 2021, uh, Executive Order 14035, which addresses diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, um, really calls upon uh, further development of those agency-specific domestic violence uh, and gender-based violence workplace policies um, as a major priority of the administration in terms of DEIA, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And in November of 2021, a government-wide plan um, to advance DEIA in the federal workforce was developed. And uh, agency st strategic plans are due in, on March 23rd, in just a few weeks, about how they're actually going to um, implement uh, this government-wide plan. Uh, and so, I, uh, yes, we'll be sharing more links. Um, I see some, some activity in the chat. We'll share links to all of this. Um, and uh, I can give you more um, granular information. But I do want to uh, commend to you a website, the Workplaces Respond to Domestic and Sexual Violence, which is a national resource center that is federally funded and provides training and technical assistance to both federal agencies and in the private sector. And, uh, and they have a lot of information about what I just detailed in terms of these new presidential memorandums, um, uh, or excuse me, the old presidential memorandum and the new executive order that's really seeking to advance and embed um, these principles uh, in federal workplaces. Uh, the last thing I want to mention, and then I want to turn it back to Robin, uh, is um, this kind of hot news that you may have heard uh, that on last Thursday, President Biden signed a bill ending forced arbitration of Sexual Assault and Sexual Harassment Act of 2021. This ends forced arbitration in workplace sexual assault and harassment cases and allows survivors to file lawsuits in court against perpetrators. Um, and so this new law, it nullifies agreements between employers and uh, employees in which employees were forced to waive their rights uh, to sue uh, in cases of sexual assault or harassment and uh, were required to instead settle through arbitration. Um, it will also apply retroactively, which is very exciting. Um, and you know, Vice President Harris emphasized in her remarks that forced arbitration uh, silences survivors and shields predators um, and gives corporations a powerful tool to hide abuse and misconduct. And President Biden also emphasized that um, this is not just good for employees, um, it's also something that really helps employers to compete um, in the workplace, right? And so kind of making the economic case um, for employers, which I know was, uh, you know, a core component of, uh, of, of the deliberations around the uh, ILO convention, um, you know, talking about why this isn't 
just the right thing to do. Um, it's also good for business. And, uh, and so this is, this was important, I think, for the president to be messaging um, this, but you know, the president obviously has a longstanding commitment to standing by survivors um, and women's movements. And, uh, and, and so we're really proud of kind of these three developments as examples of this administration's commitment to addressing GBV um, and, and harassment in the world of work. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, wow, I mean, that's a lot, right? And really is in line um, with the spirit and the contents of, of Convention 190. As you said, it's great that um, the convention particularly is um, mentioned in the first ever national strategy on gender equity and equality. Um, and, and I think it's because of the principles around culture change, around recognizing uh, the link to um, uh, economic uh, security and equality for women. Um, and so I think all of these tools, right, that are coming out, that um, strategy, the national action plan that you're developing with the different pillars, and then the global um, GBV strategy that's going to be updated. And I think it's really important for, for us to be reminded that um, you know, the United States has been working broadly on all different forms of gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work for quite some time, specifically, and I did put the chat in the chat box the link, right, to the memorandum during the Obama administration, right, that clearly directed, recognizing that the federal government is an employer. It's like one of, if not the biggest, <laughs> you know, and can set a model and provide models for other employers around the country. Um, and so, you know, to have our government take this on and adopt policies um, to address domestic and sexual violence um, in their workplaces, um, you know, starting back in 2013, um, and the OPM actually put out guidance, which I'll share the, the link to. And then also you mentioned um, um, the National Resource Center, also known as Workplaces Respond. I put the link in there. There's a lot of great materials that demonstrate, right, this recognition of understanding that yes, sexual harassment is occurring in workplaces, but there's a wider range and spectrum of abuses. And we need to be thinking strategically about how we're gonna address all of them. And one of the things that got lifted up and I think a couple of things that both of you said is this intersectional approach and recognizing we're not gonna eradicate gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work and, and less than until we also incorporate that into our efforts to address racism, um, to address homophobia, right? To address xenophobia and the workplace. These things all are often co-occurring, right? And they are, people are experiencing these um, simultaneously depending upon different social and individual identities that they possess. Um, and discrimination based on disability, right? There's so many different things. And so I think, um, bless you, um, lifting um, that up is, is really critical. And it's so exciting to see the Biden-Harris administration, as you said, picking up um, on this and, and creating the Gender Policy Council um, you know, with a senior advisor on gender-based violence. And notice the evolution of the language, right? That we're evolving in our understanding of these abuses and the need for us to have language that is more inclusive of the experiences of all workers. Um, again, what we know is that women disproportionately experience these abuses, but not exclusively. Um, and that's an important thing for us to continue thinking about. Um, so it's really exciting. And I think, you know, whether or not the US government ratifies this convention, it doesn't prevent, and you're already hearing it, right? It doesn't prevent these efforts from taking place and, and lifting up the language and utilizing it. Um, I just wanted to give um, two examples of of those efforts led by workers that I'm familiar with um, in the United States that have been going on for, for several years now and actually predate uh, the adoption of the convention. Uh, the first one is a campaign led by hotel and casino workers, and I alluded to it in my slide with those statistics, um, that members of Unite Here Local One uh, led. Basically what happened is that members um, kept coming forward and disclosing individually um, really egregious examples of gender-based violence and harassment in their jobs in the hotels and casinos in Chicago. And this led the union to take on um, participatory research, which means that the workers themselves drafted a questionnaire and then went out and interviewed their colleagues and asked them, right, what are you experiencing? And to be really clear, what's important about this process um, is that the goal was to learn more, to develop better interventions to protect workers from these abuses. Um, and as a part of that, what the union recognized is who's better equipped 
to do this process of gathering this information than workers themselves who are experiencing it. So a really specific manifestation of that is the questions that were asked by the workers were not, have you experienced sexual harassment? Again, that's a tool, that's a term that not all of us, Me Too really showed us, right? We are all walking around with different understandings of what that is. Um, instead, it asked questions like, for the uh, women working in the hotel cleaning rooms, would you knock on a door? Does a man ever answer the door naked or with his robe open? Have you ever been chased around a room and trapped in a bathroom with a man when you're trying to clean the room, right? So very specific tailored questions to that sector that led to an informative, you know, better informed understanding of exactly what forms of gender-based violence and harassment are prevalent in that workplace and then devise interventions that um, are designed to address that specific form. And so what happened as a result of that and asking these workers, what do you need to feel safe? What's the intervention, right? Because again, just to be clear, Illinois and Chicago have laws, you know, and then on the federal level, we've had laws for many, many moons against sexual harassment in the world of work. That ain't the problem, okay? We've got to look at this differently. How do we change the culture so you feel safe? And you know what the worker said is, you know what would help me is if I had a button that I wear, it's kind of like what I'm trying to get my mom to buy because she lives alone and I worry about her because she's amazing, but she's 85. But anyway, these workers are like, I want a button that when this happens to me, I'm alone. I'm isolated. I'm in that hotel room by myself, right? Or I'm standing in that hallway by myself and I feel threatened and I don't have anywhere to go. And if I had a button that if I, when I press it in these circumstances, it calls management in the, in the hotel and it calls my union um, and they come immediately, that will increase my safety, right? And if this is advertised, right? And that people who stay in those hotels know that we all wear these, right? And that that's a commitment that the hotel industry, right? And the unions have made to this. Um, in the city of Chicago, actually, as a result of this advocacy, it's called the Hands Off Pants On campaign. I love this. I'm going to share the link in the box. Um, but as a result of this, adopted a, an ordinance that requires all hotels and casinos in Chicago to issue these panic buttons to their employees for this purpose. And now um, that's led to several other cities around the country adopting similar, um, similar ordinances. And you can see how it's effective, right? Because it's tailored to the specific experiences and it's about changing the culture. Um, the other example is a movement of janitorial workers in Southern California um, who are primarily immigrant workers, Spanish speaking workers who clean the large office buildings throughout Los Angeles and Southern California. And about 10 or 10 years ago, um, they brought a class action lawsuit um, around sexual harassment and a wonderful PBS um, documentary was done about their experiences called Rape on the Night Shift. It's truly, I mean, it's really difficult to watch, I'm gonna be honest, because what they share is very graphic um, examples of gender-based violence and harassment that they experienced cleaning these buildings late at night. And by the way, you see risk factors here, isolation, language barriers, um, right, uh, occupational segregation, the majority of these workers are women, uh, low wage workers in exploitive environments, right, where they desperately need to keep these jobs and don't feel comfortable complaining about what's happening. Um, as a result of their lawsuit and coming together through their union, the SEIU, um, they actually formed a statewide coalition to um, do several things, one of which was it passed state legislation, which has now been on the books for several years in California, that mandates that all janitorial companies in the state of California have to register with the state of California and actually commit to doing annual in-person trainings on sexual harassment. In addition to that, the union supports peer-to-peer -peer driven education awareness done by the workers in their language um, on a regular basis so that workers actually know what their rights are and what to do when this happens to them and they feel supported in doing so and that if they know if they're retaliated against um, for doing so that they have uh, protections. Um, so two very different sectors, and those are just two examples, but these really lift up, as you can hear what I'm saying, right, the themes and the, the key features of uh, Convention 190. It's worker-led, it's focused on culture change, um, it's focused on the whole world of work, right, so th think about where these workers conduct their work and how they do their work, um, making sure that we're not limiting these protections to just the one place where they check in for their job or, you know, it's all the places where they do their work, they need to be protected. Um, and I think it's, um, it's really powerful and to continue to lift that work up and to continue to see 
um, Convention 190. The legislation adopted in California is a prime example of, of what a country who's ratifying this convention would do. And I think we're really excited to see more states and more localities adopt the language. Um, and we have some great models that carries um, lead and um, on issues around the human right to be free from domestic violence that really give us um, some wonderful models to think about how to lift that up. So um, I wanna make sure that we leave time for questions, but before we do that, I think I wanted to ask um, just one more question of, of Musoni and, and Carrie. So Musoni, um, you know, you talked a lot about the, the wonderful wage pro program. And what I love about it is, as you said, there are all these different partners with different expertise. And you specifically mentioned the work with, you know, um, entrepreneurs, and, and migrant workers, and also the experience of gender-based violence in the home and how that relates to safety at work. And I wondered, you know, um, with this opportunity to be thinking about this national action plan, are there specific um, things that you think are really, and with the, you know, the coverage of C-190, it, same deal, right? Entrepreneurs are covered, right? So thinking about that, are there specific things that you think the national action plan could make sure to, to take on to integrate into um, and the guidance it's going to provide to um, to employers and to, to workers and to you know to everybody, right? About how better to address gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. Yeah, sure. I think protections to for migrant workers, um, whether they're experiencing it, you know, GBV or other um, uh, GBV or any other kind of violence due to conflict or domestic violence, etc. And then protections for entrepreneurs, um, as well as mandates for uh, employers to connect their employees to, for example, GBV survivor uh, services, whether psychosocial or shelter or legal assistance, for example, pro bono mm -hmm. aid, et cetera. So I, I, I would think, you know, those were would be critical and um, kind of reflect sort of where wages lands on this on this issue. Yeah, so that's a key thing that you mentioned before that I didn't lift up, but this this awareness that to truly transform our cultures and create a culture of prevention and is is it's necessary to support survivors of gender based violence and harassment in the workplace, and concrete ways that that looks like is paid leave from work, right? Either because of gender based violence and harassment, let's say they have filed a complaint against their supervisor, don't force them to continue to work with the person who's done this to them while this investigation is going on. Similarly, if they've experienced victimization in their home, they're afraid they're gonna lose their job because they're not able to continue coming to work. Well, provide paid leave for work, right? Number of country, uh, cities in the United States and states um, have provide, started doing that. And that's specifically mentioned actually in the recommendation that goes along with the convention is those kinds of supports. And I think that's a really um, key thing. And then the other thing is all workers, regardless of, um, of citizenship status, right? We know that there are undocumented workers, and we call them globally migrant workers, right? And, and domestically, we call them um, immigrant workers, right? But they need the same kinds of protections, right? And, and I think thinking strategically about how ensuring that they're seen in these policies and included intentionally um, is really um, a critical thing to, to lift up. So, um, and I think we don't think enough about entrepreneurs. And yet, you know, I, I, um, I shared with Mithoni and with Carrie, but I recently just saw this astounding statistic that during the pandemic, there has been this explosion of people filing for small businesses, for independent businesses. And, you know, I think we'll be unpacking for many years the why of that, right? But um, a lot of those are women and women of color, right? And we really need to recognize that what C190 um, contemplates is that they're protected from these forms of abuse as well. Right? in all facets of their, of their work, interfacing with other people, customers, right? Um, and I think that that's a really um, key thing that the work that you're doing with wage, um, you know, highlights. Um, I think, um, you know, Carrie, I wanna come back to you and see if, um, you know, if there are particular things that you've heard about in your listening sessions about addressing for the National Action Plan um, about addressing gender-based violence in, in the world of work that you think really lift up these, these themes that the, the convention uh, embodies? Sure. Um, so yes, uh, we did have 
several kind of really impactful listening sessions. Um, some core takeaways that, uh, that I think are important to highlight include that addressing economic security and wellness of GBV survivors, including gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work is a core priority for a lot of uh, various sectors uh, across civil society in the United States. Um, amongst other places, the ABA Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence held a listening session. Robin gave some very compelling uh, remarks there, uh, as well as many other colleagues. And so consistently over the course of, of that and, and many other listening sessions, um, we heard about the immense individual consequences and larger impacts um, that these issues are structural, that they're societal, the culture change piece that Rob was emphasizing, um, and that we have to uh, address root causes. Um, a, a second major theme uh, was that um, civil society is really calling for the fortification of economic safety nets for survivors and their children, um, as well as support for federal labor and employment protections. Um, some, some specific things that they uh, really highlighted that they want the administration to consider include paid family and medical leave and paid sick and safe days, anti-discrimination measures for survivors, unemployment insurance, equal pay initiatives, living wages and protections for pregnant workers. Uh, and, um, and finally, kind of one core, uh, major core theme uh, was that uh, uh, survivors can regain power and control over their lives. And, uh, and it's a tool for prevention of future mm -hmm. violence uh, when we advance policies, practices, and systems um, that restore their economic independence and uh, so really these core themes, uh, this core linkage between economic security and independence, uh, as well as um, kind of addressing when and responding when, when the problems actually arise in the workplace or, um, or in the world of work uh, were, were, was something that was very much highlighted. Um, just, just the last thing I'll say about that. Uh, there, there's a lot of interest from civil society and it's something that obviously is very important for the administration as part of the Build Back Better program and the American Recovery program, um, uh, you know, to think about uh, what it means not only to kind of deal with economic security in the context of a living wage, higher and equal paying jobs, STEM education, um, but also, you know, what it might mean in terms of asset building for survivors. And so we heard a lot about match savings programs or microloans, credit building programs, banking programs to build financial resources, um, and then also about cash assistance programs. Uh, and again, those are themes that we're seeing resonate and percolate right now throughout uh, the American Recovery Plan and other uh, pieces of legislation and, um, and would really welcome additional inputs from civil society on uh, kind of how that how, how people would recommend that those you know, priorities get operationalized and, um, and organized uh, in the federal government. Thank you, Carrie. Um, now that's really all directly related to preventing and addressing gender-based violence and harassment. So it's really great to hear um, the themes that are coming up through the listening sessions um, and the work you're doing to, to draft the national action plan. Um, so we have a, a little less than 30 minutes left. And so I thought I would turn to questions. And so then if you've been holding on to your question, now is the time um, to put that in the Q&A. Uh, I think there's one or two in the chat box. So I'm going to try to um, start there. Um, so um, um, I see somebody asked if this recording will be available later. Yes. Um, the Civil Rights and Social Justice section will send out a recording um, to all participants, and then also it's available on our YouTube channel. Um, uh, Joni asked, would ILO C-190 and R-206 apply equally to all government branches? If the U.S. government were to ratify it, yes, it would. Um, but I think what I would emphasize is we're not waiting for that, right? And that there are, are efforts, as you heard um, from Carrie, right, underway now um, to implement some of the key guidance and themes and strategies that are contained in the convention and the recommendation. Um, I think those are the um, questions that I've got so far in the chat. Um, I wanna move over to the Q and A. Um, so I, I, I have a question that I think you ended up answering, Carrie, but it's, cause I think the question is which countries have gender-based violence I'm, I'm thinking national action plans and in which countries do people misuse the regulations? Because 
I mean, the question, what it reads is, is which country has gender-based violence? All of them. <laughs> so I'm just going to, there is no community, there is no population in the world that is free from this unfortunate set of abuses, right? Um, but as Carrie mentioned, I, you said there are 70 some odd countries that have national action plans that are providing really helpful guidance to you um, as you're, you're doing your, your drafting. Um, so I think, um, I think that's um, hopefully is gonna address that. Um, someone asked for the, the training tools. I'm wondering if though that was in response actually to Muthoni to you, because you talked about some phenomenal materials that you've developed through the partnership and the wage program. And I'm wondering, are any of those available online or, um, you know, we can follow up with a link, but, um, I just, uh, wanted to, to, if we can direct them to your website or you can drop the link to your website in there. Yeah. They're not available online. Um, one of the trainings that um, Grameen has done to support women to sustain their businesses or to like plan around risks is in digital format. And they're putting that in a digital format. Um, I can request, you know, uh, those tools uh, to see if they can be shared. Um, that tool and, uh, and the, the um, GPD training tool as well. Uh, but yeah, they're not on the website at all, um, but can, can certainly request to see if we, we would be able to share those. That's great. Um, there's a question here um, about how can we make GBV protocols um, appealing to businesses and corporations um, where profit is often more of a concern than the employees. Um, so the first thing that I would actually lift up, and this is why Convention 190 is a great advocacy tool, is to remind people that that was actually adopted by um, an employer group representing employers from all the member organizations from the UN, right? So, you know, over 150 countries around the world, their government, their employer representatives um, voted in support of Convention 190, um, in addition to all but, I think, three or four governments in the world um, voted in support of Convention 190. Um, and so it, it may or may not, you know, for global uh, corporations, I think um, that actually does um, have an impact, right? Because uh, as I've mentioned, Today, 12 countries have already ratified Convention 190, um, and we're seeing a lot of other countries implement it. The other thing is there is increasing uh, data um, that shows that it costs more to ignore gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work than to address it, getting to the profit question, right? Um, and I can provide those citations in the follow-up email that's going out, but um, importantly, I think some of the more interesting parts of that research are showing that when a company has a high profile sexual harassment case in the United States, for example, they actually see their share price go down. So it has a very, we're seeing just really interesting research be done. And also the research that's being done when they talk about costs, I think one of the things that has really helped us um, talk about costs in a way that's more um, effective is historically research done in this area around sexual harassment in the workplace just focused on this, the target, usually a woman, um, and how this detrimentally impacts her and her earning potential throughout her lifetime um, and all the other ways that this can detrimentally impact someone who experiences sexual harassment in the workplace. But I'm excited because the more recent research is also acknowledging that the person doing this to them also is in that workplace. It is not doing their job. You can't actually work and sexually harass someone at the same time. I hate to break the news. And that's a productivity issue, right? So if you're continuing to employ high producers, right, who are conducting this behavior, you've got to incorporate that understanding into your response. Because if you do, we're starting to see, again, increasing data sources that help us understand the cost to a particular employer, but then the lifelong cost um, to a country or a government. Um, and the last thing I would say is that this is now being incorporated into um, risk factors um, for employers, right, in terms of investments um, and the, the investments that investments for investment plans are making is that if employer has a high rate of uh, gender-based violence and harassment, that's affecting whether or not certain investors are going to invest in that company. So I think there's a lot of different um, ways that we're seeing that impacted. 
Um, can another woman be the perpetrator of gender-based violence, uh, gender-based harassment? Yep, absolutely. Um, a woman can um, commit gender-based harassment against another woman. A man can, can commit gender-based violence harassment against another man. We absolutely do see that. Um, and that's um, included in the protections under the convention. Um, so that's uh, a good question. Um, what kind of support does the workplace offer if the gender-based violence occurrence is not at the women's workplace and what obligation will the workplace have? Well, um, so under current law in the United States, federal and state law, that varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, right? Whether or not an employer has a responsibility to keep a worker safe, for example, in their parking lot or on their commute to and from work. I will say this, um, that Convention 190, this was hotly debated during the negotiations over two years in 2018 and 2019. And the convention expressly includes that employers and governments and workers' rights organizations have a responsibility to keep workers safe on their commute to and from work because we had extensive data from a number of groups of workers from all over the world who came forward and gave their personal testimony about how they were being raped or sexually assaulted in either public or worker provided, um, employer provided transportation. Um, and so that's expressly included um, because it is seen um, as such a huge issue that needs to be addressed so that workers truly do have their right to be free from gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. It also covers workers when they work, they travel for, uh, for work in any other capacity to attend a conference, um, if they work from home, um, if they do their work online, it includes all kinds of gender-based violence and harassment committed that way. Um, and so it'd be great to see intentional updates to our state and, and local right laws and our collective bargaining agreements that are inclusive of that. Um, how likely is it that the United States will formally ratify CEDAW or other human rights treaties like the ICE SCR that contain guidance on these issues within the next few years? So that's, um, so that's a little tea leaf reading. Um, um, uh, you know, Carrie, I'm happy if you wanna address this, but I'm happy to, to, to go ahead. I would just base this on, you know, 25 years ago, I, as an advocate, I was working on a campaign to get um, CEDAW ratified. And, um, um, you know, the United States does not have, has not actually ratified a lot of international treaties, period, regardless of content. I wanna be really clear, right? Like it's a, it's a broader, um, it's a broader issue. So I, I, I don't perceive it to be a content driven issue. So, you know, based on that, I, I don't know. I don't know. None of us know. Um, but, um, and it's a good question to ask, right? To, to ask members of, of Congress, because there's a whole process that's involved. Um, so I, I guess I don't know, but I would say that historically, um, we don't ratify a lot of, of conventions here in the United States. Um, Another question is where can survivors of gender-based violence, regardless of whether it is in the workplace or outside of it, find help and resources? Are there safety resources for survivors of gender-based violence regardless of whether the GBV is workplace related or otherwise? Um, so I'll start, but I know, um, Carrie, you probably have some answers to this question. So yes, there are, <laughs> uh, because um, of the Violence Against Women Act since 1994, there is ongoing support and funding for a variety of different interventions to support survivors, regardless, survivors of gender-based violence, and I should say intimate partner violence, particularly funded by the Violence Against Women Act. Um, uh, so there's a national domestic violence hotline, there's a national sexual assault hotline. The sexual assault hotline is not limited to intimate partners. Um, the national domestic violence hotline um, serves all survivors of intimate partner violence um, from dating abuse by teenagers, you know, through to elder abuse. Um, and they all um, don't limit the support services that they provide and they connect people with local services, right? Both of those um, national, and they actually have online services as well as phone. Um, and they connect people with local services all over the, the country. Um, and there's, I mean, there's a full, there's a, actually an extensive network of of service providers throughout the, the country that provide services. Again, I'm thinking more about sexual assault and um, what we call intimate partner violence domestically. Um, Carrie, I'm, I'm gonna, if there's anything I'm missing, please let me know. Um, sure, uh, that, those are all great, um, great resources that you've mentioned. Uh, you know, I can commend again, the federal 
workplaces respond to domestic and sexual violence national resource center um, as you know more more of a hub for tools uh, to assist employees and employers uh, to think about kind of what goes into a comprehensive workplace response they have uh, model policies uh, as well as links to all of the various federal government documents, but also, of course, thinking about the private sector. And uh, so they have model, model general workplace policies, model nonprofit trainings. They have videos about supervision, uh, about the role of supervisors, confidentiality, review checklists. So that's a useful resource, again, uh, as kind of for policy development. And um, you know, and, and, and yes, the hotline uh, that Robin mentioned, uh, of course, um, like the National Domestic Violence Hotline, um, there are also increasingly kind of, you know, some, some culturally specific hotlines. And, and uh, so there's the Strong Hearts Helpline that was developed several years ago, focusing on, um, on as for on, on Native American population. And, uh, and, and, there's a lot of really interesting and, and, and very deeply important work that's going on uh, led by culturally specific organizations. That's organizations that are focusing on uh, gender-based violence um, in culturally specific communities and led by uh, people from those communities. And, um, and that I wanna kind of piggyback on um, uh, another point that was made in the Q and A about making sure we're taking an intersectional approach here and uh, making sure that we kind of ground the experiences of the most marginalized populations of survivors, because we know that if we meet those people's needs, everyone upstream benefits. And so, uh, and so yes, like there's organizations out there like Ujima, which mm -hmm. is um, a national resource center on uh, gender-based violence in the Black community. Uh, there's organizations like Casa de Esperanza, which focuses on uh, uh, gender violence and family violence in Latino communities. Um, there are uh, LGBT resource centers, disability rights organizations, uh, um, and, and many other organizations, uh, the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. I'm naming just a few. Uh, many of these are, are federally funded, uh, but, uh, but you know also have kind of very important deep reach um, across our country. Um, I, I don't know, Robin, would, be, would it be okay if I just said another, said something else to respond to Joyce Lavender Che's mm -hmm. uh, uh, question about kind of grounding the experiences of um, black women and uh, non-white women um, and their, their, the pay gap there. Um, I, I, just, I just wanna, okay. Yeah, just, just to kind of, uh, pick up on what I was just saying about the importance of, uh, yes, of, of like continuing to focus, like maintain our focus on you know, marginalized communities as we think about gender-based violence and harassment in the world of work. Um, I, I wanted to refer uh, you, Joyce, and others to um, the strategic priority section of the White House uh, Gender Equality and Equity Strategy the first strategic priority is improve economic security and accelerate economic growth. They have some of the, st the horrific statistics that you mentioned in the um, in your question about, um, for example, black women earning 64 cents, Latinos earning 57 cents on the dollar for what white men earn. Um, and, uh, and anyway, they, they go on to list um, several uh, kind of strategic objectives, including promoting economic competitiveness by advancing women's employment and well-paying jobs, um, addressing persistent gender discrimination and systemic barriers to full workforce development, um, strengthening working families and the economy by investing in care infrastructure and promoting financial inclusion and close, closing the gender wealth gap. Um, and they, they, a lot of this language in there is grounded in the experiences of women of color and other uh, marginalized groups. Um, I think we need to continue to uplift uh, their, their experiences and um, maintain that while yes, gender-based violence, uh, uh, you know, as Robin said, like is 
Unfortunately, something we find throughout the world in every society in the world, it is not necessarily experienced by all populations um, and uh, in all communities in the same way, uh, depending on their relationship with the state, depending on their, their you know, relationship and access to financial services or housing um, uh, or, you know, or other op educational or economic opportunities, um, as well as historic forms of oppression um, that we need to always center. Um, so I hope that's helpful in answering some of those questions. Thank you um, so much, Carrie. I don't know, um, with Tony, if you wanted to build on any of that. Yeah. <laughs> you muted. Oh, sorry. I think you guys covered it. Um, I see here um, a question about the panic buttons and seeing them as being, um, um, you know, reactionary and not so much preventative. And so asking about um, changing initiatives that need to happen that are more focused on prevention. So I would say that... Um, they definitely, the panic buttons definitely came about in a reactionary way, right? It was in reaction to what women were um, describing that they were experiencing in terms of gender-based violence and harassment. But the, um, uh, since those um, ordinances have gone into effect and since women in, for example, New York City, Seattle, um, Chicago, there's about seven uh, jurisdictions now um, that have adopted these panic button uh, legislation for hotel workers and casino workers. What we hear from the workers in those workplaces is as they are advertised, it actually has a preventative and people see the buttons, right? And so if people who are going to commit these behaviors recognize they're actually going to be held accountable, we see that there's a decrease in the amount of the behavior that's occurring. Um, and so actually it turns out to be preventative as well, right? Like it absolutely is in the moment you're react, you know what I mean? It's like after it's happened, I totally hear like the concept, right? It's like, wait a minute, we want to prevent it from happening in the first place. And that is exactly the end goal. And that's what we're seeing, um, you know, with this intervention. And um, as I mentioned with the Yabasta program and the janitors, the peer-to-peer -peer ongoing in-person popular education, um, uh, education and awareness workshops that are being run. And there's a wonderful report done by a colleague of mine, uh, Casey Wagner out of Cornell that really studied um, the Yabasta program and why it was so successful in changing the culture in those workplaces. And it has to do with this um, ownership by the workers themselves of this peer driven educational program, right? And that more workers know and they're hearing from their peers about their rights and they're feeling more and more comfortable exercising them. And then their union, right, has really taken this on and prioritized this uh, to fight for those workers who are experiencing this. And again, bringing that intersectional lens, these workers are primarily um, immigrant workers from Central and South America um, who are monolingual Spanish speaking. And so for their issues to be prioritized with their union really is demonstrating that. And, and as I described, they're experiencing this in a different, and I appreciate, Carrie, your, your framing that way. It is that they experience this differently than other workers do because of the multiple different um, identities they they have. So I think um, I would hold up those two um, examples and, and I will make sure to, to give the link to the study that was done. It was just released last, I think, uh, November by the Cornell Labor School, um, studying this, this Yabasa program as a model for culture change, um, actually. Um, so I think, um, I think that's a great example. I didn't know if Muthoni or, or Carrie had other examples of kind of what needs to happen to be more focused on prevention and less focused on um, behaviors that survivors um, can do um, in the world of, of work. Yeah, just to piggyback off of you, I think, I mean, I agreed with all points. I think what we're seeing in Wage RBI, for instance, is sort of a shift in how MFI partner staff, for example, think about these issues. Um, you know, we're, for specifically um, Grameen walking them through sort of like their exploration of their unconscious bias and giving them, you know, an opportunity to reflect on when they had power and instances where they didn't and how that relates to conflict and gender. So, you know, I think those have been really powerful sessions to at least raise the initial awareness. This issue is a long, you know, it's a long-term investment to address this issue because of how systemic it is um, and has its roots in, in patriarchy actually. And so I think, you know, um, it's a, a small steps what we're seeing in, in, at least in the wage program and this initial awareness is, 
is a big, big uh, sort of win for the program and a notable achievement um, for WAGE in particular. It's really helpful. And, you know, something we all haven't said, but I think is implicit in the descriptions of the approaches that we're describing is culture change involves bringing everybody together, everybody in the workplace and not vilifying people who maybe are suspected of doing this and, you know what I mean? And treating like people who experience it, like they're, you know, um, innocent in the culture. We all play a role and have responsibility in the culture in our workplaces, right? And so what we have found is that these uh, popular education driven, inner peer driven uh, workshops and trainings really focus on understanding what is the social construction of gender? How did we get here? You know, I guess is the bigger question. Like, how did we get here? Um, and what we find is that there are men who also don't like this in their workplaces and also don't want to see this continue, but, but don't feel um, empowered to be a part of that process of change, right? And that there is a lot of different opinions and understandings about what um, leads to this and that it is related, as you just said, Mathoni, to patriarchy and these historical stereotypes about the roles of men and women in society and really uncovering and, and having these conversations in workplaces um, so that it's not like us against them, right? I see there's a historical framework, right? And there's a lot of research that shows that after the, the historical trainings that have been done on sexual harassment in the workplace in the United States, that um, people um, who may have been on the, who don't agree that it's wrong behavior, um, come out of that feeling even more isolated, right? And more empowered to continue that behavior. You know, one of my favorite quotes from one of those studies was um, one of the guys was like, please, yeah, give me another training about what the law says. Cause you think that's why I'm doing this? You think it's cause I don't know what the law is? That's not why I keep doing it. I keep doing it because I can, <laughs> right? And like, there's, a, there's a, a societal kind of component to this. And so we have to really think differently about um, interventions that are thinking about culture change and prevention. And Mothoni, I think your program really highlights that um, as well. So I see we're, we're just about out of time. I'm going to um, look at my notes here. I want to lift up some of our participants have actually highlighted some great resources that I want to make sure people see. I didn't know about this. Women's, women Lawyers on Guard did a national survey um, on sexual harassment, misconduct, and the legal profession. And um, it's called Still Broken, and, and the link is provided um, here. And so I just really want to lift that up um, so that everyone sees that, that great resource. Um, and um, Mary Margaret uh, Deneen has provided the link to the wage program, the program that um, Muthoni has been talking about today. So I want to lift that up as well. Um, and uh, I hope uh, you all have found this conversation to be um, insightful and helpful to think differently about these issues. This is a process. <laughs> I want to just say that we're all engaged in um, together, right, to affect change. And it's so uh, wonderful to hear from both Carrie and from Sony about their work. And I just want to appreciate um, both of you for being here, for taking this time on International Women's Day. I know you're both extremely busy. Um, I want to recognize the um, ABA staff, um, uh, Ali and everybody else, um, our captioners that made this more accessible to um, populations, um, and to all of you who, who have been here throughout the, the last hour and a half. Um, and uh, we look forward to continuing this important conversation.